to Thought Crime and Keto and Crime. Today we're continuing my countdown of my three favorite Universal Monster films with The Mummy, number two. So I want to give a shout out to my patrons and my channel members. Thank you so much. Without you, this wouldn't be possible. I would love uh, if you want to join us to, you can join below. Patreon link is below or you can just subscribe. We have a great community here. Like, share, comment that's the most important things you can do and without further ado let's get into boris karloff as the mummy <laughs> All right, Boris Karloff as the Mummy, 1931. This was one of the first Universal Monster movies that was not based on existing source material. Uh, the Phantom of the Opera was based on an existing uh, operatic work. Uh, Dracula was based on Bram Stoker's novel. Frankenstein was based on Mary Shelley's novel. However, Universal had wanted to do a resurrected Mummy curse movie, and they had scoured the annals of literature looking for one and could not find one that was already written and acceptable. So they just did this on their own. This is not a known mummy. This is not a known mummy curse. This is just one that they is an original work, which makes why the mummy to me is such a unique movie. It wasn't based on anything. They came up with the story themselves. And what it's based on is the excitement. Remember, we are not too far removed from the actual discovery of King Tut's tomb in the 1920s. And I actually have done a video on King Tut, and I will link it up here. But after Howard Carter found the famous mummy, there was concern about a mummy's curse. And what it actually ended up being was an ancient bacteria or ancient virus they released from the tomb that did cause some people on the expedition to die. But it wasn't a magical curse. It was just a virus or a bacteria, which to me is just as, almost as scary as a curse, that was released and did cause people to get sick and die or get very ill. So uh, that's kind of what they based it on. So the movie's actually set in 1921, around the same time that Howard Carter found King Tut's body and the movie opens with an archaeological expedition uh, expedition led by a Sir Joseph Wimple and they have found the ancient burial ground of an Egyptian high priest of Osiris and if you haven't heard the Egyptian story of Isis and Osiris it's kind of important to this movie what it is um, Isis and Osiris were lovers. It was, uh, they were the major gods of uh, the Egyptian uh, Middle Empire, I believe. And they um, both had cults, priests that were sworn to them that were supposed to remain celibate. Uh, Isis, who was the female goddess, had priestesses. Osiris had priests. And this priest, this mummy that they found, had once been a, a, a priest in the order of Osiris. And what happened, uh, the god of death killed Osiris and Isis used a scroll uh, with a secret incantation to bring Osiris back to life. And that's the ancient legend. Well, this movie is loosely based on that story because they find this mummy, Imhotep, who was a priest of Osiris, of Osiris And when, upon further examination, Sir Joseph and his assistant, 
uh, Edward Dr. Mueller, as well as his actual assistant, Ralph Norton, when they take off the sarcophagus lid and they notice that the mummy looked like it had struggled at some point, and then there were no signs that he had been embalmed or that his brain had been removed or anything, that he had been prepared very quickly for death, and they suspected he was probably mum wrapped in mummies and buried alive as punishment for breaking some kind of religious law because the they, they had done some studying on the cults of Osiris and uh, Isis and found that they were supposed to be celibate. They were never supposed to be any shenanigans. And what they suspected from what was written on the sarcophagus, because his name had been scratched off, it was obvious that this person was buried alive as human punishment and it was expected to dwell in dishonor and death because he was not buried with any of his possessions or anything because the Egyptians would bury a dead person, particularly a loved dead person, like a king or a high priest, with all their possessions so that they could have them in the afterlife. Well, this person was buried with nothing, so it was obvious that he was being twice-fold punished for something, and they suspected that he was probably having an affair with a priestess of Isis and got caught, and this was his punishment from the king. And then they also find this tiny little coffin that was buried within the sarcophagus with the mummy, and the engraving on it is uh, says it's the scroll of Thoth, which is not to be opened because it contains ancient incantations which can bring around bad things. So, of course, uh, Sir Joseph Wimple and Dr. and Dr. Mueller are just discussing what to do with it. Meanwhile, their assistant Ralph is wanting to open and see this famous scroll. They said he said, surely, you know, thousands of years of dirt has killed any curse, but they are absolutely stoic against the fact they're going to open that tonight. They're going to wait till they get back to the Cairo Museum, and they go out to have a talk and leave a Ralph, excuse me, leave Ralph in the building along with the mummy and the scroll. And then it cuts back to the open sarcophagus, which they have leaned up against the wall. And you see very clearly Boris Karloff, who also played Frankenstein's monster, as well as some other uh, universal monsters, is leaning like this against the thing. Very much dead. And so Ralph decides he's going to open the scroll. And so he does, and he picks it up, and he even reads some of it, because he can read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, and starts to read it. Then we cut to uh, the mummy starting to move in his sarcophagus, and eventually he basically wakes up. He walks toward Ralph, who, when he sees him, screams bloody murder. And he walks up to Ralph, he takes the scroll, and Imhotep just walks out of the room, past uh, Sir Joseph and Dr. Mueller, never to be seen again. And they go back in, and Ralph, just like Renfield, I don't know why I love the people that are obviously crazy in movies, and Ralph has a hysterical fit trying to explain what just happened, and he's basically confined to a sanitarium much like. Renfield.
Cut 10 years later, this movie jumps around a lot. So now we're in the 1930s and we're in Cairo and the Imhotep exhibition has been given to the Cairo Museum. Most English archaeologists have agreements with the government of Egypt. Anything that they find, they cannot take. It's the possessions of the government of Egypt who usually puts it in a, a museum. And some of these, these things do tour around the world, but for the most part, it's the property of the Eng of the uh, of the Egyptian government, though the English who have been forefront in ex excavating most of this are the ones that study it and come up with the science. So the Imhotep ex exhibit with everything that they found in his tomb is now in the Cairo Museum. And then we cut to uh, Sir Joseph's house where someone comes in to meet with him and it is a Egyptian archaeologist by the name of Ardith Bay. And Ardith Bay is obviously Boris Karlov, obviously Imhotep, masquerading as a real-life modern Egyptian to manipulate Sir Joseph and Dr. Uh, Mueller to uncover something for him. So he goes to Sir Joseph's house, but Sir Joseph is pretty much retired and uh, his son Frank is there along with another professor by the name of Pearson. And basically this Ardith Bay, obviously Bar Boris Karloff, is uh, telling him that he knows the way to the tomb of the Egyptian princess Aksunamen. And could he potent could they potentially be the one to do that dig? So of course, because this Ardith Bay is just creepy. Again, like Dracula, no one noticed that this person was in need of a blood transfusion. No one noticed that this Ardith Bay is obviously a mummy with a lot of heavy makeup on. But anyway, so he leads them to where he thinks this Oxunamen is buried. They do the dig and find the tomb undisturbed for thousands of years and realize that it was indeed the burial place of a princess Oxenamen, which was the son of a, the daughter of a king that was a priestess to Isis during the same time that Imhotep was. And they start to kind of put two and two together and realized that this was probably the princess or the priestess that uh, Imhotep was in love with, had an affair with, and died for. But that's not the entire story. And this is, this is unusual because, this is actually ironic because in my King Tut video, I talk about his relationship with his sister, who was also his wife. And how they were very much happy. And so I think Oxenamen is based on the real life princess. But anyway, so they open this tomb and uh, it's all, of course, transferred to Cairo. Then we cut back to a party going on at a nearby Cairo hotel where we meet Helen Gro Grosner, who is half British, half Egyptian. And she is the daughter of the governor of a British gover governor of the, elsewhere in Africa and his Egyptian wife. And so she's there visiting because she's friends with, with some of the archaeologists that are, have been on this dig. So somehow Ardith Bay manages to see her and is convinced because she looks so much like his former lover, Princess Oxenam, and she must be her reincarnation because while this party's going off, 
Going on, we cut to the actual Cairo Museum with the Oxenamen and Imhotep displays there. And we see Ardith Bey there with the Scroll of Thoth revealing himself to actually be Imhotep and the resurrection of the mummy. He is trying to resurrect Princess Oxenamen, but because she went through the entire mummification process, had her brain removed, her, you know, all that, She's not coming back to life, even with the power of the scroll. So when he sees Helen, that he realizes that she has come back to him just in the form of a re reincarnated human. So he telepathically puts a uh, trance on Helen that causes her to leave the party, go to the museum, and attempt to get in because his plan is to kill her, mummify her, and then resurrect her so that they can be eternal lovers for life. So she's trying to get into the museum, and she's not having any luck. So we have Frank Wimple, remember, uh, one of the archaeologists, the son of the original archaeologist, now the one that has worked on this, this new discovery, finds her in front of the museum and convinces her to come home with him and his, and his associate, He's, he's staying with the original Dr. Mueller. So they take her home, put her on the couch, try to take care of her because she's obviously in some kind of way. And Imhotep sees what's happened from inside the museum. So he goes to the, the home too. And basically, uh, so he shows up at the house, attempts to talk to Helen. It's entranced by her, really. I says, yes, this is the resurrected uh, form of his lover. And so he's more determined than ever to, you know, kill her and resurrect her. So while there, he gets into an argument with Dr. Mueller, who basically pegs him as Imhotep, the, the original uh, mummy that they discovered. And he kind of reveals to Ardith Bay or Imhotep that he now has the Scroll of Thoth, which Imhotep had thought had dropped while at the museum and not picked up, so the doctor now has it, and he says he's going to destroy it so that it destroys him. Well, of course, that doesn't sit well with Imhotep or the mummy, so he, he leaves, and he entrances uh, the housekeeper, which is a, uh, a Kalima Nubian. It's a an African Amer an African gentleman because this isn't America, but uh, that is suddenly entranced by the mummy and is now doing his bidding. So he tries to get the servant to uh, get the scroll for him, but he can't. So Imhotep goes back to the uh, the museum. He calls telepathically to his new servant and. The servant joins him there, and then he puts two spells. He's looking into this fountain that shows him what's going on, shows the past and the present, and he uses his te te telepathy to kill Dr. Mueller by virtue of a heart attack. And after Dr. Mueller dies, he was attempting to burn the scroll. He sends his servant back, who actually picks up the scroll and leaves. Meanwhile, no one is seeing any of this. Anyway. He then, again, telepathically calls to Helen, who he thinks is the resurrected Atsunamen, who comes to the museum, is able to get in this time, and then he shows her her past life via the fountain. And this is exactly what happened. So it shows Imhotep and Atsunamen as lovers, uh, even though they were breaking their vows for you know, being a celibate priest and priestess to Osiris and Isis. And then it shows how grief-stricken he was when the princess died, and he actually stole the scroll of thought from uh, the Osiris, uh, kind of the Church of Osiris. He actually stole the scroll of thought and was caught trying to bring Oxenamen back to life. And it was for this blasphemy and this sacrilege that the king, who was also Oxenamen's father, because lots of times princesses were banished to this us this kind of cult of uh, Isis ordered him buried alive as punishment 
to forever wander the underworld as, you know, a criminal. And because they did not want anyone to ever discover his grave after they buried him alive, put him in the sarcophagus and buried him, the slaves that actually did the job of mummifying and burying him alive uh, were killed so that no one will ever know where his tomb lies. And then the soldiers that killed those slaves were also killed so that they could never remember. They were killed once they got back to the palace. All of them were arrested and executed so that no one will ever know where he was buried. <laughs> should know. The soldiers who killed them were also slain, so no friend could creep to the desert with funeral offerings for my condemned spirit. Anks and Amen. My love has lasted longer than the temples of our God. No man ever suffered as I did for you, but the rest you may not know. Not until you are about to pass through the great night of terror and triumph, until you are ready to face moments of horror for an eternity of love, until I send back your spirit that has wandered through so many forms and so many ages. But you know what? He was discovered, he's back, and now he wants his... Love her back, and he uh, he but pretty much puts her in a trance, Helen in a trance, and is going to stab her so that he can kill her, and then resurrect her. Meanwhile, Frank, who is now in love with her because of course, breaks in and fights both the servant, gets past him, and then fights with Imhotep, but Imhotep is too strong for him, and he's about to kill Helen, and then Helen herself wakes up remembering that she was indeed the Princess Oxenamon and goes over to the museum to a statue of Isis and prays to Isis for him, for her to protect her from the sacrilege of a mummy. Y'all, the statue of Isis comes alive and kills Imhotep, basically break, burns the scroll of Thoth, burns it forever, uh, and that causes Imhotep to crumble into dust, and the spell is broken. So now Helen Oxenamon is going to marry Frank and live happily ever after. And y'all, that was the mummy. So there's not, there were several sequels to this that wasn't, that weren't really a sequel called the, the Hand of the Mummy, The Curse of the Mummy. All of these came later, but it was not the same mummy. Uh, Universal moved on to a different story. And this was actually, uh, the mummy in the sequels was actually another mummy called Karis. And if you remember the Brandon Fraser, brilliant Brandon Fraser mummy series from the early 2000s, this, that was also Karis. The Tom Cruise 
crap fest we got in 2017 was also Karis. So that's why I like this version of The Mummy, because it was truly an original. It has never been remade. It has never had a sequel. It was a standalone original story from Universal, starring the phenomenal Boris Karloff. And that's why I like it so much, because it, it has never been remade. It's never been touched. Now watch them do it, now that I've said that. But the other mummies were based on the mummy that came after this one. So this one is unique and a standalone and a great watch, especially if you're like me and like Egyptian stuff. So that's my number two favorite Universal monster movie, The Mummy. And with that, I'm going to end this. I will be back tomorrow with the count with my number one favorite movie synopsis, The Wolfman. And until then, Keto Comic. <laughs>